Hi, my name is Magnus Ekman. Welcome to my course, Learning Deep Learning, from Perceptron to Large Language Models. Before going into the details of the course contents, let me introduce myself. I have a PhD in Computer Engineering and also have degrees in Statistics and Economics. I got introduced to artificial intelligence more than 20 years ago and at the time did some work in the field of evolutionary computation. However, my focus throughout my career has been on computer architecture, which is about the internal architecture of computers. I work for NVIDIA, building machines that among other things are used for artificial intelligence applications. A couple of years ago, I published a book named Learning Deep Learning, which this course is based on. However, this course also contains some new material, given that the field is moving forward quickly. The course is meant to be self-contained, but consider also reading the book if you want more details on a specific topic. The course consists of 11 lessons. In the first introductory lesson, I describe what deep learning is and the course prerequisites. In the next two lessons, I teach neural network fundamentals and basic deep learning concepts. This is followed by lesson four about convolutional neural networks and image classification. You will learn how to build a network that can identify the type of object in an image. The next three lessons, five through seven, are about sequential data and language processing. You will learn how to build a machine translation application that can translate a sentence from French to English. The next three lessons contain some more advanced applications. Lesson 8 is about large language models that got popularized with the release of ChatGPT. Lesson 9 is about multimodal models that can mix different types of data, for example text and images. You will learn how to build a model that takes an image as an input and produces a textual description of the image. Lesson 10 will introduce how to build an application that does multiple tasks simultaneously. It also describes some more advanced computer vision topics. The final lesson discusses some aspects of applying deep learning in practice. In particular, we touch on ethical aspects related to artificial intelligence. Let's get started. We will now look at the evolution of the GPT models. The GPT family of models have been very influential. This slide shows the key models and we will go over some of the differences between them. Overall, they all use more or less the same architecture, but they are scaled up in size and they are trained in different ways. Today's models are 1,000 to 10,000 times larger than the original GPT model. As already described, for GPT-1, the focus was supervised fine-tuning for the end task, but they also demonstrated some ability of zero-shot learning. GPT-2 is a scaled-up model, and they explored the zero-shot capabilities further. For GPT-3, it was scaled up further, and the focus was on few-shot learning, which is something we will describe in a little bit. Another model is known as Codex, also used in the Copilot project. This is a specialized model for writing programs. This was enabled by using supervised fine-tuning, but this is a different type of supervised fine-tuning than the original GPT model. Instruct GPT, which is the technology used in the Chat GPT product, used both supervised fine tuning as well as reinforcement learning with human feedback, or RLHF. Both GPT 3, Codex, and Instruct GPT uh, use the same sized models, but they have different goals and they use different training methods. They are roughly the same architecture as GPT 1 but 1,000x bigger. Finally, GPT-4 is likely a combination of multiple models. It can also handle multimodal inputs of both text and images. 
Let's now talk about the focus of the GPT-2 study. We have already described how the first GPT model did fine-tuning, but was also evaluated on zero-shot learning. In the GPT-2 study, they focused on the impact of scale and showed that just scaling the model made it much better. Instead of using these kind of contrived interpretations of probabilities as we described for GPT, in this case, they just let GPT-2 generate the answer in plain text. After all, it is trained to generate text. So as an example, just ask the question, who wrote the book The Origin of Species? And the model actually generated the answer, Charles Darwin. Or another example, you prompt the model with an English sentence and the corresponding French translation, and then provide another English sentence, and the model generates the French translation. This was later known as few-shot learning. In this case, we did one-shot learning, where we provided one example. We will see more of this in the GPT-3 study next. Note that this capability was mostly enabled by just scaling up the model. There were some minor tweaks to the normalization and weight initialization schemes, but otherwise, it's largely the same type of model as GPT-1. On the previous slide, we looked at one-shot learning with GPT-2. We provided one translation example, and then the model translated the next example. The GPT-3 study formalized this in a concept called meta-learning. They have an outer loop that used the unsupervised pre-training, and then they have the inner loop known as in-context learning, which is done at inference time, where we provide examples to the model that the model can learn from. The chart of the slide is from this study in the paper. This shows the impact of the number of in-context example as well as model scale. So as we move to the right on the x-axis, first we start with zero shot, so that's uh, no examples, then one shot, which is one training example, and few shots, so multiple training examples at inference time. The different curves on the slide shows the impact of the size of the model. Apart from demonstrating few shot learning, the GPT-3 model also has been shown to generate very coherent text. Note that this in-context learning technique was a discovery. It wasn't really a goal that they set out to solve. However, there's also some doubt about if these conclusions were accurate, and we will see that more about that in the prompt tuning section in a later video. Let's now look at some examples of how to use uh, in-context learning. So this is the type of learning done at inference time. We'll start with zero-shot learning. This is simply a task description and then a prompt. So here we say translate from English to French and then we say the word cheese and we want the model to translate this. If we would do the same thing but as one-shot learning, we would have a task description, one example and then the prompt. And then finally, few-shot learning, we would have the task description, followed by multiple examples, and then followed by the prompt of what we want to translate. We will also here provide an example of text generated by GPT-3. So in this case, what was provided as a prompt to the model was a title and a subtitle of a news article. And then GPT-3 generated an article corresponding to this title and subtitle. In the paper, they also did a study where they let humans try to determine if an article was real or if it was generated by GPT-3. For the example on the slide, only 12% of the respondents managed to answer it correctly that this was generated by GPT-3. Let's move on to the codex model. This is a specialized model based on the GPT-3 model, but it's built to generate Python code. This is technology that then later was used in the Copilot product. In this case, 
we start with a pre-trained GPT-3, which has been pre-trained on natural language. We then continue training it or fine-tune it on programming code, still using the next word prediction task as the training objective. This was then followed by supervised fine-tuning, where we provide a doc string that describes the functionality of a function that we wanted to implement, and then we train the model to emit the code implementing this function. So note that this was different fine-tuning than what was in the original GPT paper. Here we are training it to emit the correct text on the output, rather than training it to do a classification or some other odd solution. Basically, we have input, which is language, and output that is language. And then finally, they evaluated the model using unit tests that were checking the functionality of the generated code. Here is an example of the, what the resulting model can produce. So we start with an example prompt to the model, which is the doc string describing the desired functionality of a function, as well as some examples. And the model then produced a completion, which is basically the code implementing this functionality. And this code is actually correct. We will now talk about instruct GPT. As we have already described, GPT-3 has been shown to generate very coherent text as its output. However, it's not necessarily the text that the user wants. If you ask it a question, it might provide you with a list of similar questions instead of the answer. So the focus on the instruct GPT study is to align the model with the user's intention. The goal here is to arrive at a model that is helpful, honest, and harmless. When, we learn, when, when a model learns to predict the next word, it is not necessarily aligned with that objective. After all, it's trained on text taken from the internet, and all text on the internet is not necessarily helpful, honest, or ha harmless. In order to do this, they introduced reinforcement learning with human feedback, or RLHF. The Instruct GPT technology was later used in the Chat GPT product. In this case, we start with pre-training, so we're predicting the next word as before. The next step is to do supervised fine-tuning. In this case, we use human written prompts and answers. So this is known as an instruction data set. It's a data set used for the model to learn to follow instructions. The next step in this process is to provide prompts to the model and then just get responses from the model. We will then have a human that is ranking the quality of these responses. We will train a separate model known as a reward model that can be used to rank responses. Once we have this trained reward model, we can use that to automatically fine-tune Instruct GPT further using reinforcement learning. We will look at more details on the next slides, but without talking about the details of what reinforcement learning is. I don't think it's necessary to understand that to understand the big picture. For the RLHF step, we will need a reward model. This model evaluates the quality of generated text. It's trained to mimic a human's preferences, and this is to align Instruct GPT with a human's intentions. Let's look at the reward model in more detail. The first step is to build a data set. We will build this from crowdsourced prompts, but not answers to these prompts. We will feed the prompts to the model, which will generate a response. A human will then evaluate the combination of the prompt and response and provide a score. Our data set will now be the input is the combination of prompt and response, and the label or output is the score. We will now train a model that takes the prompt and response as input and then generates a score as output. This model that we're training is based on GPT-3, 
but a different instance than the one we're trying to train for the real task. So this is similar to training the original GPT to classify movie reviews as positive or not. We're trying to classify a combination of a prompt and response as good or not, but not as a binary answer, yes or no, but on a sliding scale. So now we have a way of automatically scoring the GPT-3 output by using this trained reward model. The next step in reinforcement learning with human feedback is to use, to provide a prompt to GPT-3. GPT-3 will generate an output. We also provide this prompt and the generated output to the reward model, and it will generate a score. Now we use reinforcement learning to improve GPT-3. Reinforcement learning is a technique to make the model find a better solution based on reward feedback. If we ignore reinforcement learning for a moment, and we just look at the model above, we can think of if we are freezing the reward model and the prompt, we simply do backpropagation to maximize the score, and that will lead to a better fine-tuned GP3-T3 model that is aligned with the human's intentions. Let's su now summarize this entire process. We start with pre-training the model to predict the next word. We then fine-tune the model with a prompt and a continuation, for example, questions and answers. This is known as an instruction data set. We then do reinforcement learning with human feedback. We do this by training a reward model and then using this reward model to automatically train without having labeled examples. Note that reinforcement learning with human feedback is not strictly necessary. You can get very good results by just doing supervised fine tuning with an instruction dataset. Now let's look at an example of what ChatGPT can do, which uses the InstructGPT technology. We ask it to do something, as in this example, to describe how a large language model is trained in a way that a six-year-old can understand and the model will provide us with an impressive answer. Here is another example where we're asking the model a question in a different language, in this case, Swedish. The translation to the question is, can you provide a brief description of deep learning? Please respond in English. And ChatGPT provides an impressive answer in English. So it's, we can see that it understands different languages and can follow instructions. Let's also now briefly mention GPT-4, which accepts both images as, and text as an input. It is a multimodal model. We will discuss that in more detail in a separate lesson. There is not much known about the GPT-4 architecture at this point, but it's likely a combination of multiple models. It can show advanced reasoning abilities for example, theory, on, theory of mind, which has to be, do with reasoning about how different individuals perceive a situation. Let's look at one example. In this case, we have Alice who puts a file in one location, and then Bob moves the file without telling Alice. And then the question is where Alice expects, expects to find it. And GPT-4 then responds accurately that Alice likely expects to find it where she had put it because she is not aware of that Bob had moved the file. We have now seen the evolution of the GPT ca capabilities. One fair question to ask is how come the transformer was an encoder decoder architecture for translation, but we can ask chat GPT tra to translate something and it does well, but it's just a decoder only architecture. How does that work? One, thing, one way of thinking about this is that parts of the lower layers create an intermediate representation, so they act as an encoder. And then the upper layers decode it into the output, so they act as the decoder. In reality, it's not clear how this actually works. The model is very complex and very hard to understand. This concludes the description of the GPT evolution. 
and we will now move on to other aspects of large language models.